When you're staying in the indecision, you're staying in that fantasy of pure, limitless potential. And that is a lovely place to be for some period of time. I think it's important to be able to stay there when we're young, for example. There are some people who feel so anxious, they just want to figure out what their career is right away. It's like, well, maybe take some time. Go waitress for a little while and see what that's like. You know, don't decide, oh, we've got to go to graduate school tomorrow, you know, because when I don't even know what I want to study, but I, I feel like I want to just collapse the tension and know. It's like, well, it might be better to just leave that open for a little bit. So there is a time to leave it open. But if you stay there indefinitely, it means that you never really live. One of the things that struck me about this and, and actually made me want to talk about it was, um, it was, it was actually, I think, a tweet by one of our listeners and a colleague that I saw where she made the point that decision, the etymology of it, the, the decision part comes from the Latin to cut. So it, it's literally to cut away, but it's the same etymology as suicide or homicide, the, the, the second part of the word. So to, we're sort of murdering the other options. We're, we're, we're cutting away the other options. We're, we're killing off the other options. And I think that speaks to the archetypal nature of the decision because it really does mean that we are, uh, it lifts up, I think, why it can be so hard to make a decision, because we don't want to have to kill off those other options. Uh, and, uh, and there can be a lot of kind of mournfulness about having to do that. You know, little things, but obviously big things too. I mean, one of the big decisions is who do you marry? Mm -hmm. And that is a real killing off of, the, of other options. Or, you know, what graduate program do you go to? Or what college do you pick? These things feel really big. And in a sense, they actually really are. I mean, if you marry person A versus person B, your life might be different. So uh, that there is that sense of having to um, countenance the fact that you're really closing a door on a potential version of yourself. Which brings up a certain kind of existential feeling as you say that, because to suspend a decision is to live in a world of limitlessness, and that if we think of the decision as cutting off the limitless options, there's something um, fateful, mortal, about saying, I, I only have so much time, energy, resource to pursue this person not all persons, to pursue this career and not all careers. So there is that um, weightiness to, to the moment when we say this and not that. Yeah. You know, we've done two other podcasts, I think, that kind of touch on this. One, we did do a podcast on being indecisive, I believe, a long time ago. We also, a long time ago, did a podcast on um, the Pu'er, this, this kind of archetype of the eternal youth. And, and that touches into it because I think one of the qualities of the pu'er is someone who can never commit to anything. And that when, when, when everything remains in, in potentiality, when life is all potentiality, but it hasn't, when you make a decision, you kill off all these potentials, you sort of prune them away and you come into a specific form in time and space. You know, you, you become this particular individual. And uh, so the necessity of making a decision of killing off other options is part of uh, kind of growing down into our own life. And maturing, really, and not, not staying in this place of pure potential. Right, growing into reality, that kind of reality principle. Yes, yep. It also reminds me a little bit of uh, the Myers-Briggs typology, which is a little bit different from Jung's typology, because the Myers-Briggs folks added another dimension that they call the P or the J type at the end. And so J types uh, tend to be more decisive, and they find indecision to um, be tremendously anxiety-producing. 
And so it's painful and distressing to not finally just call the game. It's going to be this and not everything else. Well, people that have more of a P type, prospecting type, for them to make a a definitive decision brings on an enormous sense of loss because of all the other possibilities are suddenly not available. So we're also holding that tension between the anxiety of ambiguity and the grief of cutting away all the many possibilities. And um, it seems, based on the Myers-Briggs folk, it's about a 50-50 split (laughs) in terms of just human nature, which side we trend towards. But it still brings up this great question of, what is it inside of us that moves us towards a decision versus staying in some other softer um, place where we either don't or don't have to or refuse to actually make a decision. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I'm thinking about uh, people who really, really struggle with making decisions and how painful that is. And in our modern lives, we are asked to make so many decisions. And you know, there's research done about this, about decision fatigue. I remember this wonderful story, which I think is true, that Obama had like 10 black jackets and like 10 black, or when it was, maybe it was Navy, I don't know. But he, had, he, he didn't want to have to make a decision about what to wear mm-hmm. because he, he was making so many other decisions. And they've, they have studied this and there is, you know, there's an ability you know, the, the surgeon who goes through his day having to make life or death decisions about, you know, how to treat patients comes home and it's like, does not want to have to think about what to have for dinner. There's always a little, I mean, we love the, the idea of choice, but it also stresses us out. And when you go and you're going to buy toothpaste, you know, there's like, I don't know, 20 different kinds of toothpaste and, you know, breath freshener and it's going to whiten your teeth. It's going to, it's going to do, you know, it's going to do everything, but drive your car. And, and it, it can be kind of overwhelming. I, I totally relate to that. You know, I, I'm doing a little bit of a renovation work in one of my homes. I mean, this is going to sound like a ridiculous example, but I have to pick the towel bars for the bathroom. And so like I click on Amazon and there's like 800 choices to make and and it's amazing that there's so much creativity and resource in the world but that exact moment of what the hell is even the criteria for something like where am i casting about it's not a consequential decision but it still speaks to this flood of images and possibilities which is too much to actually sort through on a conscious level and I've certainly worked with people who, you know, their presenting problem is I have trouble making decisions. Mm-hmm. And you can feel the sort of exhaustion of that. So, you know, and what the research says, as I understand it, is it's, it's better to just pick something and just pick something and move forward. And that it probably doesn't make such a big difference what you pick. And it makes sense to me from a depth psychological sense, because when you're staying in the indecision, you're staying in that fantasy of pure, limitless potential. And that is a lovely place to be for some period of time. I think it's important to be able to stay there when we're young, for example. Uh, You know, there's some people who feel so anxious, they just want to figure out what their career is right away. It's like, well, maybe take some time. Go, you know, get, go waitress for a little while and see what that's like. Don't, don't, you know, don't decide, oh, we've got to go to graduate school tomorrow, you know, because when I don't even know what I want to study, but I, I feel like I want to just collapse the tension and know. It's like, well, it might be better to just leave that open for a little bit. So there is a time to leave it open. But if you stay there indefinitely, um, it, it, it means that you never really live. I'm really thinking about the way that each of us has to discover how we set up a valuation system inside of ourselves. And sometimes we just don't have enough data. So we do need to perhaps go and wait tables or perhaps join the Peace Corps for two years and travel and 
and wait to absorb enough facts about ourselves and the world in order to set up a criteria. So thinking types will uh, accumulate a lot of rational clarity about what decision or what option is more valuable. And feeling types have to discern what they like or don't like in increasing levels of intensity. And both of those things take a lot of energy and a certain amount of exposure to the reality that one is evaluating. Mm -hmm. But like your towel bar decision, it's almost like, you know, past a certain point, it's like you just pick something, right? I'm sure. (laughs) (laughs) And then then, then I'll complain about it, you know, for the the next 20 years, like a goddamn towel bar. But that, but that's an interesting point though, because I think that, you know, part of making a decision is having to live with the consequences. That we're at the towel bar crossroads. <laughs> I was walking through a, through a woods darkly and <laughs> the path diverged and it was all, <laughs> my future was determined, consequences and risks and yeah. opportunity of the towel bar. But, but it is interesting that for some of us, something as um, small as a towel bar, which is a funny example, mm-hmm. can take on um, a level of dread or import mm-hmm. for reasons that can be very mysterious to us. And that may be that the archetype of the decision has become its own complex. Yeah. Yeah, say more about that. Well, if we think about just the complex theory, just as you said, there are innumerable decisions, tiny and life changing, that we have had to make in our lives. And and all of those decision moments come together and satellite around the archetype of the decision. And if that has been a particularly fraught process, if we have a lot of really disturbing, painful memories around decisions we've made, it may be that when we approach even a small decision, that the entire complex begins to beat its drum and we begin to feel incredibly anxious as if it's as big as some of the decisions that haunt us, but it may just be a towel bar yeah. in the reality of the moment. Right. So I think if we have disproportionate anxiety or we act strangely around decisions, we have to be curious about our history around that and also even perhaps the history of our parents because how they orient to decisions gives us a sense of whether or not we can trust ourselves or trust the world. 